Well, it's 10 o'clock and we're kind of on a mission today. We're all excited, but boy, are we in for a treat today. We're going to listen to some pretty good stuff from a pretty good friend of mine, Leo. Come on in, Tim, sit down. But, you know, <clears throat> Leo and his family are in North Montana up there along some pretty big country, some pretty beautiful country. Four generations, his, his, his folks, his wife, and a brother manage a place up there that he's going to tell you a little bit about today. Uh, everything that Leo does brings, brings character, credibility, and integrity in everything he does. Anything that Leo is involved in usually is worth listening to. Leo is a giver of his time. He's been a two-time director of the Montana Stock Horse Association. He was a Region 5 Regional Environmental Stewardship Award winner for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And he's part of our Montana GLCI Grazing Lands Coalition where we help fund some of the research and stuff that he's going on. We're just tickled to death to do that for Montana. Uh, working with this new deal with, with Vince Industries, I think you're going to find a wave of the future, something that we all want to see, the new girl in school or something new that makes things life easier. And how about the distribution of livestock? I don't take a lot of his time, but uh, he does everything well, and I call him a great friend, and let's look forward to learning from Leo. Leo Bartholos from Montana. Thank, Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, is everybody enjoying the venue here? I've never been to the East Coast, so this is great. I've really enjoyed it, and I hope everyone else is as well. So the first slide, um, virtual fencing in? with vents, um, and uh, Rancher Stewardship Alliance is a, a nonprofit, rancher-led nonprofit conservation group that I support and have been involved with for a long time. And our mission statement is ranching, conservation, communities, a winning team. And we are try to be the hub where people can come together and find solutions and add to our local economies and our conservation. And I would like to thank, as Bob said, GLCI helped fund my opportunity to be here, and I certainly want to thank them for that. So this is within the Rancher Stewardship Alliance. We have what we call the Conservation Committee, and this is a lot of the partners that we work with. Uh, the Conservation Committee funds fencing and watering, CRP, well drilling, pipelines, a lot of CRP up in our area has, has been unfenced for years and years, and with the farm economies being what they are, we want to help retain those grasslands in grass. We also help fund reseeding of grassland. Uh, we've, we've made a positive influence on over 30,000 acres of farmland and CRP land, keeping it in grass and helping young people get started. Uh, we're funded by a lot of grant opportunities, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, U.S. Fish Wildlife Service, World Wildlife Fund helps fund our administration and, and helps with a lot of the other projects. We, we just engage with a lot of partners to create a hub of support for our communities. So the Vents, Vents product company that we're working with, and right off I'd like to introduce two representatives from Vents, Todd Parker here, lead engineer, and Jeff, just a new, new employee, come from Pasture Map, I think, to help help me work through the technical stuff on this. So if you have any technical questions and want to talk to somebody post presentation, these are the two guys that know all about how it works. I just operate the thing. So this is, this is a blown up slide of the way it works. So I, I'm there managing the cows on the ground and I reach out to Todd, the little slide to the left there, and he helps me work through the pasture planning and the logistics because it's not just quite completely straightforward but it's pretty user friendly and then Todd sends the programming directions up to these repeater stations we call them um, they're they are convert a cell phone signal to a radio signal which transmits to the cow to the next slide and once the callers are programmed which can take as little as a half an hour up to 12 hours so then then uh, from that point on, the caller communicates directly with the satellite. So we can, we can plan grazing out depending on the number of moves. Uh, you know, you could plan them out a month if you wanted. Or if you moved every day, 10, 15 days. So, so it's, it's pretty, pretty versatile. Um, once the caller has their programming, it does not have to have insight to the repeater station. The repeater station, you have to 
be a line of sight communication from the repeater station to the caller. And once it has those directions, it retains them in size and only communicates with a, with a satellite. In, in our landscape, rolling hills, uh, we don't have, there's very few acres that aren't in line of sight to a tower, but in other areas, dense tree cover or rough terrain, you know, there would be some, some issues to work through, but they're capable of doing that. So on the north end of the map is Canada. To the west side of the map, east side of the map is Williston, North Dakota. And the red is, of course, Barthamus Ranch and the Matador Grass Bank owned by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, I put that on there because we graze yearling heifers there for cow replacement development. And we're part of a, um, a grazing cooperative. The Ma Nature Conservancy manages it and we pool our herds. There'd be 1,400 replacement heifers on that ranch in one herd. And it's a way that we are addressing landscape issues and, and working with the conservation community. So I'm about 30 miles south of Malta and about 30 miles north of the Charles M. Russell Game Range. So this is an, a bit of an overview of the ranch. This, this is a typical picture of the terrain, the geography that we work in. Uh, we manage about 20,000 acres of land, half of which is federal land or state land, mostly federal. The other half is private. We were running 700 mother cows, but if, if you missed it, we are in a bit of a drought up there, so there's a lot less of them now. Uh, we retain replacement heifers at, at the Matador Grass Bank. Uh, they graze there from April 1 through December. I think they come home tomorrow, actually. My brother's taking care of that. Uh, now we're also grazing some stalker steers that we raise. We implemented that practice for drought. They went down the road in May because it wasn't raining, so I guess it worked. It helped. It didn't work. So we're a dry land ranch. We have no irrigation, say. We just survive on big weather events, whether it's deep snow or big rains. Uh, the ranch is, is uh, watered by 50 pits and reservoirs that are you know, some were built in the 1930s. Uh, same way with, with the hay production that we put up. It's a flood irrigation system that we can, we can irrigate a thousand acres in a big flood event. 500 year flood, we get a little more than that even. So here's a picture of the Barthamus Ranch, a little history. And I didn't mention before, but if you have some questions, just raise your hand. We can stop and talk about this because there's 23 slides and some of it will be questionable. Okay, so historically, the, I came from Mile City, my family did. We had a small number of pastures. We put up hay all summer, took Thanksgiving off and started feeding it out in the winter. And that's kind of the way it was run. There was not a lot of grazing management. Uh, but I started with uh, Bob Lee's help back there and others. I started to understand holistic resource management and uh, you know, started research and there had to be a better way because it wasn't, wasn't functional over time. So after 40 years of studying holistic resource management, we are up to 38 permanent pastures and then we subdivide some of them with temporary fence. And then we started to work with the Vents company in 2019 and now we have 80 or more pastures the number of vents pastures that we can develop is, is unlimited based on our goals. So what, many of the reasons why we are here, uh, I don't know if anybody's priced out the cost of barbed wire lately, but uh, aging costly ranch infrastructure, we have fences that are 80 and 100 years old. It's dry up there, 11, 12 inches of moisture a year. So our fences last a long time, but at $20,000 a mile to replace those permanent fences, you know, there's got to be a better way and still manage, you know, grazing practices. Uh, as everybody knows, carbon sequestration is suddenly a big deal. And, and in order to participate in that, a lot of ranches are going to have to have a lot better control of their grazing management. And we, we we're working at developing ways that, that the, this room full of people here can participate in that because there could be some substantial financial rewards for good grazing practices. 
Turns out the area that I live in is the last largest grassland in the world. The last intact grassland. And there are, we are one of the la best core areas for the sage chicken. That's been in the news many times. Turns out that antelope pictured there, he migrates through m my community and it's the second longest wildlife migration in North America. They travel from Saskatchewan, Alberta, down through United States, across the Missouri River and down into southern Montana. So this is a huge, huge, valuable resource for the conservation community. That's one of the reasons the Nature Conservancy was, is there. Uh, and with the fencing that we have, the infrastructure that's in ranch lands in Montana and most of the American West, creates a lot of, of uh, conflict for the wildlife. So we're, we're trying to address that because of the partners in our conservation community and it's profitable to have good relationships rather than spending money on conflict. So we, we worked to try and develop that. It turns out, and I didn't know this until we were hosting a part of a tour a year ago, that that creek that runs through our property is the boundary line between the wetlands, um, the duck ponds and the sagebrush steps. And so that it, it just, every time I work with people and go to these things, in the Phillips County area, I find out more about how valuable the region is and, and as, as the talk this morning illustrated how important grasslands are. So I, it's, it's amazing. Uh, so what is virtual fencing? Well, real-time monitoring and control of animal location by callers. It's an amazing product. Right now it's about like a bag phone. I'm sure in a, I'm sure in a few years it'll be about this big. It will be. It, there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a, a lot of steps. It's a quality product. We are finding value in using it. A lot of value in using it. Uh, it's in in some of our rangelands on the north end of the ranch. The BLM rates it at a whole, only 150 pounds an acre. It's not very cost effective to fence that any way you do it. This tool because all the costs, most of the costs are tied up in the, in the towers, uh, this tool makes it cost effective to, to manage the grazing on some really low productive soils. On the, on the east side of the ranch, we're about triple that as far as forage production. So it, this is a product that allows us to implement intensive grazing or more gr stock density allows us to uh, increase our rest periods and do all the correct things that a good grazing management manager should do. And we don't have to build the infrastructure, which you know, saves a lot of labor, a lot of costs, and creates zero conflict with the, with the wildlife. So, I mean, it's just a pretty win-win situation. We have, we have uh, you know, Great resource support group from Vince through Todd, and uh, he's the lead engineer that I work with. And it's been a, you know, they're always reaching out. There's updates yearly. Yes, sir. Uh, we start with a collar on every cow. I think it's the best thing to do, but there's some attrition over time. Uh, and we'll talk about that, that collar that's in the picture there. Sometimes they will invert and lose the, ability to physically stimulate the cow when she's misbehaving. But it, it's best to do that. But at some point in time, there's things start to fade away and, and you'll still get really good uh, management when there's only 70% of the cows. Depends on where they're at and the season that they're grazing. And I'll talk about that a little bit here later on but no every it should start with every cow yeah yeah so the animals are managed safely with a combination of of sound and electronic pressure a little buzzer goes off when they when they approach a vents line which you can adjust for width for the sound and the physical stimulus so 
So the first the sound goes off to alert them that they're approaching it, and then if they're persistent in their direction, then they will get physical stimulation. Two prongs of a hot shot, actually. Like Pardon me? Like yeah, <laughs> only, yeah, yeah. Todd, t Todd tells me that it does hurt, but I've never had the courage to grab on and drive through the line. <laughs> so uh, it's battery operated. Uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that Vince is working through is battery life. Uh, we're only you know, six, seven months in, in my situation. The smaller the pastures and more contact that the livestock have with the Vince line, the more battery you're going to consume. Uh, customers in Australia are reporting up to two years with, with the Vents collar, so uh, sort, supports a broad range of animals. Uh, the new collar design even supports a greater range. We've been putting it on animals from 900 to 1,500 pounds. We sold most of the 1,500 pounders there in this drought situation. So uh, all collars are operated individually. I mean, if you had a good tagging system, and Todd tells me there's a way to do it, you could maybe sex cattle pairs and stuff by turning collars on and off. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, gee whiz cool stuff that you could do way out in front of this, but I don't have that good imagination. I need a 20-year-old to help me. So, um, so it works, it works pretty darn good. Um, I, I will. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that is useful, uh, unique about it is, is that the virtual fence lines are one-way gates. So if somebody's busting through a line, they'll get pressure from their collar. But on the way back in, they don't get pressure. And you can use No, it, it, uh, they've built in a lot of foresight into the use and management of the tool. Um, and you know, it's like when I first started building an electric fence, uh, I, we had rogue animals, they did not respect it, you know, you either lived with it or sold them, so yeah. You had a question, sir? Yeah. They're pretty watertight, and uh, I see my cow stand out into it belly deep, and I've never seen a submerged collar because that's how we water as well. And so I, I don't think there's a, been an issue at all. Um, you know, it was hot this summer, and we had cattle that were out there being cattle in the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, uh, I don't think watering in a reservoir will impact the collars. They're, they're really well sealed. So, yeah. Uh, so this is a picture of a base station, and this is the initial <clears throat> map that that Todd developed when we were working with him. And starting in April of 2019, uh, Todd did a lot of the work from San Diego on Google Earth to find the, the best locations for the for the repeater stations. There's five repeater stations on the ranch. And we've got 99% covery on the ranch. Of course, you can see that band of coverage. I've, I've also got as many acres on the neighbor's property as, as our own, which you know lends itself to a very positive situation in the fact that the neighbors or adjacent landowners could participate in the caller and use the signals from, our, from the towers that are on our property. And they could build maybe a small number of additional towers on their property and get full coverage on their property. So it lends itself, would lend itself well to multiple partners going together to share the cost of the towers. I mean, that, that's really, uh, World Wildlife Fund is looking at, we're putting a pool together for a program so that 
they can do just exactly that, you know, put some ranchers together and, and defray some of these costs. And even, even where there's a few blank spots, as long as the collars are programmed before you enter those pastures, you still have effective animal control. Sometimes I'm a little late doing that, so it don't work, but yes, sir. As long as the collars are programmed within a site of, as long as the collar comes within line of sight of the, of the repeater station, once a collar is programmed, then it communicates directly with a satellite, so it doesn't need to be, it, it goes straight up to a satellite. You, you know, in heavily wooded areas, there might be little, take a little longer to, to program the collars in and stuff, but it, it hasn't been a problem. We don't have a lot of difference in elevations across a ranch, but there's some places. On the north end of this, this map here, there's a little gray finger sticks down in there, and that's the poorest coverage on the ranch. And, and the, the cattle will come, we program before they go in there, so then they have their direction. So it, you know, there's strategies to work around. You know, all these ranches, all these grazing operations are site specific. so. We will all have to figure them out. Yes, sir. You had kind of mentioned it with your electric fence, but what is your training regime when you're starting this with your cattle? Actually, I got a few slides up here in just a little bit. We'll talk about that for sure, for sure. Yeah, because it's it's interesting. It, yes, ma'am. Do y'all have one solid perimeter fencing, or is everything all in the bins? Oh no. Haven't haven't removed a fence, you know. I'm a conservative kind of guy. I I I never replace stuff that works, and it's still working. So. so you do have a solid perimeter all the way around. Yeah, we have a solid perimeter. Uh, there's yeah, I'll get into that a little bit, but you know, we have 60 miles of barbed wire on the fence and 15 miles of two-wire electric fence. So we have a lot of infrastructure that hopefully someday can be less of, but. Leo, we got one more back. Oh, here. I'm sorry. So I just have a question. We have the opposite situation. We have a high humidity, a lot of snowfall. Like, is there adverse effects in that kind of environment for either the, the tower stations or the traffic on the cattle? Generally, from the tower point of view, we will put them up on hilltops because that's where you get the best radio communication. And typically, that also means wind which has been good from a snow point of view. We've got a similar situation on Leo's property where we haven't had a lot of issues, issues with snow. Um, we do have a, a fair bit of experience in Colorado uh, up high. Um, similarly, wind has saved us from snow. If you put it in a draw or something like that and it gets buried, game over. You know, if the solar panel gets gets buried, you know, the uh, um, the batteries will deplete. We do have uh, um, the towers are designed to have what's called five days of autonomy. So if the sun goes away for five days, everything still keeps going. There's enough battery in there to keep it keep it going, intended to last through fairly significant weather events. Um, with respect to the collars themselves. We have not seen any issues with the collars due to snow. I would say mostly because if there's that much snow, then the, cow, the cows aren't going anywhere. So we're, we're able to tolerate as much snow as the cows can. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> Could it be a plug-in instead of solar? Yes, yeah. it can be. But for Leo's property, there weren't, there weren't enough plugs across you know, the 20,000 <laughs> 20, acres. got a question about the durability when you process the cows you know we run our cows through typically once or twice a year to either pregnancy test or to give them uh, free calving inoculation vaccination so how does that work uh, yeah so how does it work to process the cattle through the chutes so so I'll just go into this because we, we have lots of time I'm burning through these pictures way too fast but anyway 
So there's some assembly required to the collars to get them to length. We, we build a random, well, a pre-planned random number of lengths to address the average number of cows from, you know, the smallest we've ever collared is 37 inch neck up to a 42 inch neck. So we keep all of these the boxes full of random lengths, 30% of them are 39, 40s, and 41s, of, you know, so there's, there's that. And then when we are collaring animals, uh, we catch them in a, in a hydraulic chute, makes it a lot easier, and, and they collar very quickly, you know, with this program. We, we're doing 100 an hour with a six-man crew, you know, two people feeding cattle, two people that to shoot, and two people stockpiling collars at a table so we can have quick gas access. Uh, when we go to take the collars off, our raceway leading to our hydraulic chute allows us to pull those collars off like when we're preconditioning the batteries will be mostly depleted and we're into a situation where we don't need as much grazing management so we'll pull those collars off and then we'll put them back on maybe two months later when we start uh, into our grazing regime at maybe at preg checking or you know we can put them on a hundred an hour, it doesn't take very long to just schedule a day to do it so and then we do the same thing again in March we'll bring them in to the winter ground when the snow gets too deep to to graze them out or we run out of forage we'll just put them through the corral our cows have been through the corral so many times and uh, you know it's not a big deal anymore yes sir so are those collars identified for a certain animal and I'm thinking of grazing traits so if you've got a lead cow or certain cows that graze differently than Good question. So are, are the callers identified by cows? And I'm going to let Todd answer that because he tells me it can be done. I don't do it. I'm a commodity guy. So, so, so each caller does have its own unique identifier that we know from the wireless communication. You can also associate that with an ear tag. We're also looking at embedding an EID directly into the collar. So for folks who really want to track tightly, you can wand the collar, be able to assign that to the animal, be able to tie that data in if you've got automated weighing or anything else with respect to identification. So you can tie that data together. We do have ranchers who are doing that and being able to do things like you said, identify you know, bad actors, good actors, there are things that we'll be able to do in the future with respect to animal health and be able to identify an animal that is, say, not traveling as much as her peers and that's an indicator that maybe that she has something going on. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. But would you be able to map if, let's say, 90% of your cows are grazing this area this time of day, can you map that to that pasture? Yes. We've got a set of slides. Yes, we've got a set of slides that are going to kind of demonstrate that. Yeah. And with and with the unique identification, you could also take that same data and say, I want to see how these 10 animals out of my herd of 50 grazed versus the other 40, and compare them side by side. Just a little short story about that. Todd put a collar on a side by side when we first set up the towers to see to make sure they were all working, and it, it was amazing how far, how many places I drove that. You just do it, and it was it was amazing. Yeah. A any more questions here? Oh, yes, sir. Are you ever going to be able to get that down to where you can use an electronic ear tag and be able to collar? I'd love to be able to do that. I think uh, from a from potentially regulatory use of electronic ear tags and whatnot, there's a there's a it's a complex problem potentially, and it, and it's not only going to be just us. And so, yes, definitely, maybe. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Good questions. Uh, so here, here we're going to talk about the Herd Manager web application. This is the screen I look at on my desktop computer. Um, 
And so I sit and visualize the pastures I want to make. And no, it's not very big, but in the middle, by the green pasture on the lower end, you'll see all those little blue icons. Those are the collars on the cows in the pasture. So if I was more self-disciplined, I could get up every morning and tell you where all the cows are at. But, you know, I got things to do. We'll go fix fence or something. So I, I don't, but uh, it, is, it, is, it, is a, it is a valuable tool. So you are, you know exactly where they're at. And Todd tells me once in a while, there hasn't been a cow move here. You maybe go check her. And sure enough, she should have been checked. You know, she may have ate too much of something. She's not going to move ever again. <laughs> now we, we have pulled collars off of deceased animals, that's for sure. So I visualize a farm. Todd built this beautiful map, as he does for every rancher. Uh, and then we use the icons are on the map. And they, so we can track location history and, and I don't know how big my file is, been working with Todd for since 2019, but I'm sure if he's got all this stuff saved somewhere, it's huge. Uh, so we create and manage cattle herds. Um, we create and manage the virtual fences and we manage herds and fences on a schedule because I have to pre-plan a ways out. I've never had this kind of control or autonomy when it comes to moving cattle, so it's a learned skill for me that you could actually create fences that require daily moves or weekly moves this often in the landscapes I live in. It's just, you know, it's a bit out of our, we're largely dictated to some degree with our grazing partners, the Bureau of Land Management, which has been very supportive of this project. But uh, this having this much micro control is a bit a little more than my imagination can present once in a while. Uh, and then Todd records the grazing histories from uh, completing grazing activities and, and we try and figure at acres per day and those kinds of things, animal days per acre. Yes, sir? How quick can you make a change in your rotation of where the animals made? Takes about two to 12 hours to program the collars, so two to 12 hours, you know? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Yeah, this is, let, me, let me add a little more color to that, Leo. So the, the collars themselves can contain 16 independent virtual fences, which could be 16 independent rotations. That can all be scheduled ahead of time. I think Leo might show an example where we did a ladder graze, where we set that all up ahead of time, and the ladder was scheduled, a fence line would turn off, another one would turn on to be able to do a fully automated, you know, rotation. And those changes there, once they're programmed in, they're actually scheduled by the clock. It says, all right, three o'clock on Tuesday, this line's dropping so the animals can go down to the next rung of the ladder, for instance. In the corner? Yeah, that was going to be my question, how do you get them? Uh, we will we will talk about that in a few slides coming up. Yes, yeah. Do you foresee being able to do away with your base stations and all by satellite? Would you repeat that, please? Do you foresee being able to do away with your base stations and do everything by satellite? Luck, luckily, technology is moving all the time, and so yeah, eventually this will go satellite direct to the collar. Yes, it's not what we have today. Uh, the last question I have is kind of pertaining to like public lands grazing and monitoring aspects. Can you monitor riparian areas to show that your cattle have not been in that circulation? We can. Can you, can you track we, where, where they are and how long? Yes, you could do that. Okay. Don't know whether you want to, but you could do that. Well, it cuts both ways. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yes, sir. I may have missed this earlier. I'm sorry if I did. Uh, what's your uh, range on the, the uh, uh, power that, that you've got line of sight? About 15 kilometers. You know, so uh, as. <laughs> eight, eight miles. Eight miles. But we, we, we have had some communications go 30 miles. Not something that we would rely on, but we have had some surprises and 
in, actually in Idaho where it was pretty remote. We hadn't put something up, but we had a neighbor that was going, oh, the callers are talking to the neighbor 30 miles away. Yeah. Okay, well, do, do another slide. Uh, so this is, a, this is an overview of uh, Barthamus Ranch and Vincy's relationship. Uh, we collared, uh, we reached out to the Vince company in April of 2019 and Todd was, didn't have inventory of collars so he accepted our proposal through the Rancher Stewardship Alliance to be a pilot project and so we never collared any cows till November of 2019. There was a, you know, we had to get NEPA from the Bureau of Land Management, which, like I said, they've been very supportive of this project. They're good partners. And, uh, and we had some grant funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because of the antelope migrations and the sage chickens. Uh, you know, there's just, that's a sensitive area and it needs to be, issues need to be addressed. So we have a lot of support for that. Uh, Todd did a huge amount of preliminary work in April through August. Uh, I think it was August, Todd came up and we rode around in the rain, which I'd like to see again in a side-by-side -side and, and ground truth all of these tower sites to make sure we had enough phone signal and, and uh, a young lady that works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service went with us so that she was actually instrumental in getting this project going. Um, and then in, we went and Todd started sending five towers in on pallets that needed to be assembled and there was six of us worked in our shop for three days to assemble the towers. Then we had to take them to these high hills and anchor them to the ground and, and uh, so that we could get them all placed and Todd directed the signals so that we could capture the right signals. And so that took about four and a half days and then, uh, and then we started collaring cows, I think the 19th of November and Todd came up and we had 450 cows to collar in two days and we got 19 the first morning. Needless to say, a little panic set in, but, but by the second afternoon, we were doing 100 an hour. We had it figured out. But, so, I mean, it's, it's just a work in progress. There's no doubt about it. It was really cold, if I remember. It too. was really cold, but it's November <laughs> in Montana, close enough to Canada to speak the language. So, so wow. So we recolored then, we grazed the cattle out, targeting, and I'll go into this a little more, targeting uh, outlying areas that cows won't typically graze because it's not proximity to water, lack of water. So then in 20, spring of 2020, we collared, collared 350 cows and started back through the ranch. Um, and we just, just, now we're in a cycle of repeating this. 2021, we grazed out till March because of the, you know, the ability to harvest unharvested forage that was old and decadent, which we're still eating because of the drought. And then in 2021, we again put collars on this spring. We have chosen not to put collars on this winter because of the lack of rainfall. We can only graze the cows out for another 15, 18 days and so it wasn't worth the effort to deploy all those callers, 400 callers for a month or six weeks. So we chose not to participate in that. Todd sent me the newest version that we'll put on some cows to test and expose them some, to some thing. So cow behavior, this was a question. So this is November of 19. And this is the test fence or the training fence that went on here. The, the red line is a 100 meter incentive zone. And then there's a, you can't really see the gray line. Maybe it's not on there, but there's a gray line there. That's the audible zone inside that fence. And on the, the little round circle on the left side at the end of that red line, that's the corrals. And we collared the cows and on the north side of the red line is their typical winter grazing period. So we built a fence line right down the visible barrier of a barbed wire fence and turned them out. And that's where they all learned what that audible warning meant. And maybe a few of them learned what the physical stimulus went. So we had 90% compliance in five days. And then after four or five days, well, three to four days, then we would start 
cross fencing that pasture to the south, keep moving the boundary south, and as those cows graze through that line, then they wouldn't be able to go back. And that's, that was kind of the start of a, you know, our, our conception of ladder grazing. So in, in, uh, in about seven to 10 days, we had 95% compliance. And, and at the bottom of this, it says historic grazing memory matters. I was, I was questioned about that this morning, actually. And the reason that does matter, it's easy to manage cows if they're where they want to be. When you start pushing against that institutional knowledge, and as we did, we drove them clear to the south end of that pasture that rarely gets grazed. And it's not a big pasture, but they want to be somewhere else. So when you start pushing against that institutional knowledge in that cow herd, they resent, resent it immensely. So grazing history matters. You're going to get more pressure requiring them to do other things. Yes, sir? Did you sell the 5% that didn't? Oh, heck no. <laughs> nah, nah. What was the management of Just ignore it. You know, I mean, it went from from zero essential big big landscape management to managing 400 cows and 95% of them behaved. I mean, it's a, it's an insignificant number, and it wasn't thus. And a thing I've observed too, it's not the same cows in the same place every time. So there's a rotating, you know, there's a cow that I calved in this area. This is where I want to be. She did that. She came back. She stayed with the herd. I mean, there's. There's all of these behavioral things that I don't understand fully, just have a little insight into the way they behave, but no, it's, yes, sir. So to that slide, how large was your total pasture area? Uh, that pasture is a mile wide. There's 1,250 acres in it. Gotcha. Uh, front, it's a mile and a half north to south. You know, it's got that little diagonal jog in there, so. And as you were training, you just started one boundary on the north end of it. Boundary to start with, you train them stay away from that physical boundary by 100, 100 yards. Yeah. And then you started moving that that training boundary down and pushing them towards the end of the pasture they didn't historically use that much. Yes. And not allowing them to go back to where they wanted to go. Yes. And yep. And what was your water sources within that that pasture? Uh, there's a. There's a water source you can see on the bottom of the screen. There's a, an oblong bottom water source there. There was a well where we in the corrals. And then we're fortunate or unfortunate, depending on what you're used to and having snow. And once we get four inches of snow, we quit opening water for the cattle. And that allows us, that's the really our savior and our situation. That allows us to graze in cold weather in isolated or outlying tracts of property that don't get grazed in the summer because of the distance from water. But so that, that's, that's really our, our advantage for us. So, so, and right, oh, about a week after we got those cows collared, it rained enough or snowed enough that we quit opening water for them. Yeah. Oh yeah, Canadian's been doing it forever, you know. Yeah. Okay, the other question is, you said you push those cows south. Uh, they push themselves south. Do you use that vertical fence to push them? You can, but it consumes a huge amount of battery. Okay. And the battery, battery needs to be protected. Battery life needs to be protected. So you can push them by essentially expanding that ex incentive zone we can slowly creep it over time, and that as the effect of pushing the animals. And what I mean by slowly, we could move the animals from the north section of this 1,200-acre pasture to the southern half, and we would probably do it over the course of 12 hours or maybe a full day just to try and expand it down. The other thing we might do is layer virtual fences and again, because it's a one-way gate, if the animals have a tendency to, move, to kind of migrate south, we back fence them from going north. And fundamentally, from animal behavior, once a few animals start headed south, everybody kind of wonders what's going on, and you back fence them on the way down. And that's how you can, another way you can get a movement. Yes, ma'am.
No, we didn't because it was a rested pasture that we reserved for fall cattle work. No, they, they, they didn't. There was no, no situation. And that's one of the intimidating things about having this much control over your animals. Uh, I don't move them with the fence, with the fence line, partly because I'm protecting battery life. And I also, I'm out there monitoring forage quantity. And, you know, so I, I move them with an ATV or a horse and, and try and work with their natural inclinations to go certain, because I, yes, sir. Yeah, this, this, this product is only a limit, limited by your imagination. I mean, literally, I've been, yeah, they're getting lots of, I've been, I've been fielding calls from ranchers that are adjacent to large unfenced farm acres. And, you know, that's, that's the very route they're looking at is, you know, working with their adjacent farm neighbor to graze cover crops to incorporate that vegetation. So, so on a cover crop approach, you can also take that concept I said about creeping the line to move the animals, to actually creep the line to give them more feed, and you can creep graze with That's it. That's what I mean. Zach's, yeah, so we've done creep grazing in Australia, and that's the type of thing where you can decide, I, I just want to move that line, you know, uh, 10 feet every four hours. And you just kind of move it along, and those animals are following that, that tasty forage. Yes, ma'am. Can you speak to how this fence product compares to the others on the market, like I think Shepherd, No Fence, and Addison from Australia? I can't speak to that because, in actuality, we reached out to E Shepherd in 2018, and they said they were going to provide us with product in 2019. and they said they couldn't import it in the United States in 2019. Thankfully, somebody found Todd and Vince Company and they were willing to, you know, support us in our project. So I can't speak to anybody else's competency or quality of product. I know Vince has done a tremendous job for Barthamus Ranch and, and, and many other practitioners around the West. Yes, sir. Yeah, so we're, you know, so, so we started with Leo in 2019, very early days. I mean, the, the company is about five years, six years old, old now. I would say we're commercially launching this year. We are engaging heavily here in the U.S. I've got a number of customers that are coming up starting in January, preparing for this spring. So, so you know, we're out there actively selling. We don't have, you know, infinite volume but we're not piloting anymore this is commercial engagements uh you mentioned you're from australia no i said i'm from minnesota and i, oh. I don't know australia just had this so thank you for yeah. coming from australia i think that's where you're from no no, no I, you know we're 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 a california-based company oh, sorry, saying, in australia, I so but we do work in we do work in australia so we you know we started off with two markets australia and the u.s <laughs> You know, and we started off in Australia because of the nature of the, of, of the beef industry there and, and the value of virtual fencing in, the, in their vast areas. But, you know, we're here, we're here doing business next year. Lyle? Can you give me uh, or us an idea of the capital outlay? Um, so a herd of Leo size. What did, you say, did you call her 400? Or 400. Something? That's 400. a nice round number. So get, give, give us a ballpark figure of what we're looking at. And then annual cost. So uh, the capital aspect of it is related to the towers only. Um, the numbers of towers needed are basically related to the size of the property and the terrain. Um, we're able to accurately model how many towers you would need to provide coverage for your property. You saw Leo's coverage map for five towers. That was covering his 20,000 acres plus a bunch of other, you know, area around it. Um, 
give you a, some similar types of data on that front. We have six towers in uh, Eagle uh, uh, area in Colorado. It's out near Vail. BLM actually bought those towers. Those towers cover 360,000 acres, uh, probably about 15 producers, and 100,000 acres of grazing allotments. And so that's a very broad area. And there, there are other spots where, because of terrain and whatnot, that we, the, the numbers are less impressive. But we're able to model that. For most ranchers, you know, we see between two to three, four towers are necessary. With what we know today, we might even do less on your property, Leo. We, we kind of built the crap out of, out of your spot since we were starting, starting early. Getting to the dollars, you know, the towers themselves are between $10,000 to $12,500 each, depending upon how much support you want from an installation point of view. You want to ask about the towers or I'm going to get onto the collar cost? Well, I would also like Leo to talk about the added storage harvest that you get in the whole cost aspect. Okay. So getting getting back to, 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 to the collars, the collars are there is no capital outlay for the collars. They are entirely service based. So you're essentially leasing the collars. Uh, they are $35 per animal per year. That does not include the battery, uh, which is another cost. And we do that because battery consumption varies depending upon how intensely you use the collars. If you're doing something like a creep graze or daily rotation, the batteries are going to last three to four months because you're really intensively you know, you know, use, using the technology. Doing something like what, what Leo's doing, um, five to ten day types of moves. We're working on nine months worth of battery life, and we're always working to, to, to move that forward. Um, one of the benefits of the leasing approach is you're not outlaying your capital on a collar that could get obsolete. And this is new technology. It is developing. Leo, you're getting your, th I shipped you your third version of collar third version of in collars. three years. And we're not making money yet. We, we don't make, we're not making money for a while yet. The technology needs to be further improved and stabilized. We are going out for real next year, so I better start making money soon. Uh, <laughs> um, did that answer your question? Yep. All right. Uh, Behind you was asking one other question, unless yours is related to. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I work with some smaller operators, and this sounds very affordable. Presented there, but there's got to be a minimum cost to go with. You can't support, let's just say, 20 animals at 35 dollars. So, so we're managing we're managing that right now by basically who we're able to support. We're not able to support a rancher who's only got 50 cows right now. Okay. You know, our, our threshold of entry ideally is at 500 animals. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to start with your entire herd on day one, but we want, we're trying to engage with folks who have that business opportunity for us, and so that, that's where we're at today. Um, as the technology matures, as entities like Nature Conservancy maybe get involved, or BLM, or Forest Service get involved, and now maybe some of that tower capital is actually managed elsewhere, maybe NRCS is putting it up, now that potentially opens the door to smaller producers, uh, and that's kind of the, you know, our thought on that front. No, not necessarily. It, I could I could do that today. In the future, I don't. Uh, it's not our intent to do that. Our, our future, you know, our, our intent is to make the technology mature enough and to have enough partners so that 
the operator with 50 animals comes in and pays the same amount as the guy with, with 500, it's hard for a rancher with 50 animals to justify $10,000 for a tower. Th that math doesn't work out for them, or if you kind of, if you amortize that. But if somebody else is coming in and say, hey, you know what? Leo's got a tower up and he's got a neighbor with 100 animals. You know, maybe leverage that coverage. There's probably discussions as to how, you know, the neighbors relate to each other, whether they're, you know, because Leo bought that and whatnot. So does that help? Yeah. Okay. Uh, cost per battery is ten dollars each, and they're a very specialized battery chemistry for temperature. Um, and uh, there is no annual software fee; that's all wrapped up into the collar uh, service fee. Okay, I'll well, we'll move on to another slide and oh, create it. Might be one more. Okay, I'm sorry. What about smaller animals? Yeah. So uh, our latest collar uh, has the flex flexibility to go down to about a 23-inch, 24-inch neck size. So basically, a collar will go on a yearling. I don't envision that we'll ever collar calves. That's probably not necessary and, uh, uh, and whatnot, but we are starting to do work uh, uh, with, the, with the smaller animals. And we've got producers who are looking to put us into a stalker operation, uh, you know, which will have you know, its own set of unique challenges. You know, in particular, I think, you know, just getting back to kind of Leo's case and some of, some of the things that we've learned, that institutional knowledge that, that his animals have, that is something to work against you know, initially with the collars and using the collars to, to change that. Once we've changed their institutional knowledge, now we can actually maybe even use that. And maybe we're using it for battery life. And, but you get to a stalker situation, everybody's brandy new every year, and they're teenagers, and so lots of things to work against, so to speak, from a collar point of view. There's a lady back here in just a second. So there's, so there's nothing restricting anybody from taking one of our collars, putting it on a dog, goat, sheep, some of the other species I've been asked about, reindeer, buffalo, and bear. <laughs> Whether or not it's going to work because of the animal's psychology and whatnot, um, we don't know. We haven't been on any other animal, you know, other than other than a cow. I mean, wild horses is another one that the BLM is tremendously interested in. Um, but there's a whole aspect of does the whole concept work for other species? And, and this gives me a good opportunity to talk a little bit about something that 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 Leo kind of hinted at. Um, the collar is not a joystick 
for the cow. It's not a joystick for, for the dog or sheep or goat. So when you look at it, how well does it work on any, any one individual cow? It's not going to be perfect. But when you look at, getting to my point, what is successful, hey, did you achieve what you wanted to achieve on your land? And that's what we're here talking about this technology day is what are the goals for the land and how do you use this technology for the land? Back to your case, you know, would it work on a dog? Maybe in some situations, I can guarantee you we can tell you where the dog is. <laughs> Whether or not we can keep the dog from chasing a rabbit, pretty much guaranteed no. <laughs> um, dogs are smart, because it's, it's not unlike the perimeter fences that, that you know, that exist today for dogs, and my, my dad had one, and his dog learned to bolt through the fence, take the hit on the way out, <laughs> and on the way back in, he would sit at the end of the driveway waiting for dad to turn the fence off so he could walk back in. We have another question right here. So. Oh, mine was just asking the same thing. Oh, okay, okay. Like well, we're getting short on time, so we better. We are uh, starting work on sheep, though. <laughs> Uh, so the, the next three slides, five slides, four slides, are going to be about the program, the ladder graze that we implemented this spring, trying to ramp up our control. Uh, that's just an overview of the way they work. So in this slide, the rectangle on the left, we called her the cows uh, at the house. And then uh, just because I could, and it was cold and nasty, we built the vents lines and we just trailed the cows to the right of the screen and uh, they weave back and forth hitting the vents line and, and just stayed where they're supposed to go and just trailed them a mile, mile and a quarter to the vents line to the new pasture. And the water source in the triangular pasture is on the very north end where that really big red spot is. That's the only water source in this, in this grazing area. So they were in this area for about five days, 250 acres and 400 cows. That was, that, was, uh, that was the accumulation of grazing time over five days with heat map. So this was, the, the vents went down and they were across that thing in hours. I mean, literally, they have no memory of where those vents lines are. So when you, when you change pastures, when it goes down, somebody will find it within minutes because they're always looking for that greener plant just beyond where they are and they just move. That, that movement there took an hour, two hours maybe. I mean, they just... So there's a five-day accumulation of grazing. And uh, this, this project that we are looking at because I don't want to confuse the cows with a number of vents and wagon wheel them into water and, and making them go in a circle. So uh, Bill Melton, a pioneer grazer in, in, the, in the Montana community, he was talking about not back fencing cattle if their stock density is high enough and they wouldn't regraze. So we've been doing that with vents and it looks to be a very workable situation because that's the only water source in this pasture. So they were in the, in the north half for five days, and then they grazed in the south half for five days. And the whole point of this exercise, as we'll see in the next slide, when I turn them in that pasture the first day, that's where they go, that little red corner. Well, we kept them out of there for 10 days and then, and then let them in there. So we increased our stock densities, increased our rest periods, and still had fresh feed in front of those cattle. And I was calving there the whole time. Uh, we were calving, I think I, 30% of those cows calved in that 15 day period they were in there. Maybe 40%, I didn't keep track. But so that, <clears throat> that's a demonstration of what we're calling the ladder graze system. Move into a new water, build a perimeter around a water source and then start moving them away. And that last spring in a different pasture, I didn't put the slides on, uh, we were, had those same 400 cows and we were giving them 90 acres a day every couple of days and as soon as that line went down they were in there grazing. And our soils and stuff are so erratic, you know, we have some pastures that produce three times as much as others so it's really important for me to be out there monitoring those cattle, especially when they're calving every day, at least once a day, to monitor their forage quantity so I don't run them out of grass. 
So that, that's kind of a demonstration of our ladder grace program. I think long term that's going to be our best tool that I'm going to have on the Barthamus branch and it may apply to many other people as well. Let's see, so that was an example of 2020 fence lines. I don't remember the exact number but we were doing a lot of experimenting because you can see the configurations aren't the same. Messing with their memory, you know, forcing them to do stuff. Um, you know, just, just just, it's just, I have to learn as much as the cows because I've never had this kind of management authority. It was mostly a negotiated piece. <laughs> so our economic goals are the payback that we think we can achieve on our property. Uh, we have incorporated more of the floodplain into our summer grazing program. We'll go through those larger pastures on a 10 day rotation prior to vents. We'll, and then we'll come back after the spring grass growth is done and graze more mature forages so that way it gives a chance to rest. And, and if we were to stay out in our BLM allotments through the whole summer, we would have to come in earlier, which is fine. But the thing that happens is they continuously graze if we're not moving them and that really impacts recovery. So the Vents product has allowed us to to break down the big pastures into a lot smaller units to start to increase our rest periods for our grasslands. So then we go back out in November when it's decadent grass and force those cows, encourage those cows to graze those outlying corners where there's gray and decadent grass that hasn't been grazed in years. And we supplement them with some kind of a protein and let them eat snow so they're not traveling a lot and burning a lot of calories. And, th and that's our goal. So. Um, Last year, we fed hay in March. That's when we started feeding hay. Well, normally we feed hay mid-January and you know the economics, 60 cents a day to graze versus $2 a day with last year's hay prices. Can't even touch that this year. Um, so that, that's, our, that's how we're gonna pay for these operating costs. And, it, and the other benefits we're gonna have is a lot of protein supplements were used this summer in, in the West to support their pastures. And if we can raise the nutritional level by having grass that's only one or two years old in, in reserve out there, we'll ha minimize our need for additional protein supplements. So there's a lot of moving pieces that we're trying to develop and understand. So it's certainly, yes sir. They'll learn it, yeah, yeah. No, I agree, I agree. And the reason, a little sidebar story, it was about eight years ago, we had the pastures in a, in a we had the cows in a pasture, had 400 cows in a, in a three, four section pasture, and there was a, a well running 24 seven in the corner, in the one end of it, and we were supplementing with, with alfalfa hay for protein, and. And there's about 12 inches of snow on the ground, and my brother and I got to looking around. They hadn't been back to water for seven days. You know, that confirmed everything we'd read in the Stockman grass farmer. You know, they will eat snow. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it, 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 all ranches are site specific. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, so no. Uh, since we've, you know, that really opened up a lot of opportunities for us to change the management on the ranch and um, and that old dry brittle grass, it breaks off a lot better with high stock density in the middle of winter. It's dry and crusty and frozen and, you know, it was probably zero the day I took that picture. Leo, we got another one over here. Oh, I'm sorry. A tower question. So looking at that picture of that tower set up, it seems like the hardware component of it is fairly fairly simple is there any specific reason that couldn't be set up as a portable tower system no but the solar panel is big it's okay. a wind sail it's, it's basically a standard size that you might put on a house three foot by five foot so if you're putting it on a trailer we have customers who put it on a trailer you want to anchor it pretty good 
And that's, that's the whole complexity of our install, is really anchoring it to the ground. The whole setup is rated to handle 120 mile an hour winds. How tall is your standard actual tower? The, the, the mast itself is 20 feet. And we will, we will sometimes on, on obvious hilltops not actually deploy to the full 20 feet. We'll deploy it to 10 feet. And then you don't have to guy it out as far because you're not worrying about that mast getting, getting bent over. Any of the hardware sensitive enough that if it was mounted on a trailer going over ranch roads, you're going to permanently damage your, your equipment? Presently, yes. But it's mostly just a mechanical thing. And the hut, the hut itself, that aluminum box, it's all put together with standard hardware and lock washers. But we've actually put them together and transported them over you know, six miles of ranch road. And then you're picking up nuts and bolts that came loose anyway you know, in the bottom of the, of the, of the pickup truck. So you know, today, we need to do that. But I think in the future, that can all be kind of hardened down. Um, the other thing that's important, though, is, is that these towers really shouldn't be just placed anywhere. They got to be placed where they can presently reach a cellular phone <coughs> signal, because that's how it communicates to the outside world. And you want to put them on a spot that's going to be advantage. And so rather than have, say, a fully portable tower that you put any, anywhere, we're think, calling it nomadic, where, hey, you know what? It's your summer season. You drag it up onto this top. Maybe you've put a concrete footing or an earth anchor to the ground that you tie the trailer in. All right, now it's the fall. You move it to the next spot, and you know where it's going. So you map your whole place for efficient points. Yep, ahead of time, and then you can move it. You know, you know, with the animals, and that—that that is, that's the concept that we're working towards. Forest Service is extremely interested in that because they want to be able to really just put up the towers during the grazing allotment period pull the equipment out to minimize recreational impact. And uh, so it's coming. OK, we're, we're about out of time. We'll take a few more questions. Yeah, what's the, the threshold on stock density? So like if you, you said 90 acres for 450 head, could you do 30 acres for 450 head? I guess correlation with abiding by the, the vents and number of head. I, I think you can push is push till it fails, yeah. and it don't cost you anything to fail. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you just run the cows out of grass. That, that's it, a simple it's answer. It's that and it's battery. Yeah. 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 Yes, ma'am. Are there conditions that impact the uh, caller's communication satellite, like clouds or other weather conditions? So the, the communication to the satellite is really GPS. That's, that's the satellite communications we're talking about. So it's, each collar has a GPS in it, the same as you might have in a Garmin handheld. And so it's very robust uh, to weather. We haven't had uh, any issues in rough terrain. Um, one thing you might see a little bit of difference is, is the accuracy in that you know, if it gets super cloudy or if in heavy, dense tree cover, it might not be as accurate of a location. So we will say that the accuracy of the collars is going to be between 3 to 5 meters, so 10, 10 to 20 feet type of thing. You design the virtual fence boundaries to accommodate that, the width of them. And you also design those widths to uh, animal behavior. And so for a lot of Leo's property, we will have a management zone where the, where the collars will apply pressure 100 meters wide. That manages the accuracy. It also manages the animal's behavior. You want to give them enough chance to come in. I'm getting some sound. What am I supposed to do? I keep walking. Give them enough chance to turn around. Versus if you make that too small, they come in, they get one stimulus, and they're on the other side. That doesn't work. So a long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> there was a question right here.
So, so we have an accelerometer in the device. There's lots of opportunity for that. Uh, temperature, a little bit different. Um, hard to get a good, accurate temperature with a collar sitting on the neck. Though we have found that that temperature is a good way to track whether a collar has fallen off an animal, particularly in Montana and it's 40 degrees <laughs> below zero. You see a collar that's registering anything below minus 10, it's not on a cow or not on a living cow. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so uh, basically we're talking about this slide. You know, the collars, you know, there's improvements, there's room for improvements. Uh, retention and inversions where the the probes are ineffective. Uh, new hire right here in the room to help the herd manager interface. Uh, and the geometry, Todd just talked about the geometry. I, I made a little mistake last spring and I was short 50 feet from a fence line and by gollies they found it. I had that, they just leaked right through that 50 foot span because the geometry isn't quite 100 percent so Hmm. Extended it out and put them back where they belong and everything's fine. Yep. So, and battery life, of course, and it's just, it's just such an evolving technology that things are progressing very quickly. So, it's your turn to ask questions. There's some contact information for myself, the Rancher Stewardship Alliance, Todd, and then Josh Zimmerman, Zimmerman uh, their market, a marketing guy that's working in, in the northern tier. So, more questions, I'm glad to answer them. Uh, I'm sorry if you've already mentioned this and I just missed it, but <clears throat> would it be possible to uh, put one of the towers on, uh, say, a, a concrete foot or something like that? Um, because where we are, we're kind of downhill from everybody else around us, so we get some kind of fast-moving water every once in a while. And uh, we just, we, for like water tanks and stuff, obviously you're supposed to have Nothing, nothing restricting you from, from that sort of thing, though if you're on a slope, that means you might not be at the top of a hill, which yeah. might not be the great from a radio point of view. Right, right, right. And, <laughs> and it's not like, you know, we don't have the, the steepest grade ever, but it is, we do get, I'm mostly worried about the fast moving water. Yeah, so in that, in that situation, yeah, you know, a concrete footing and, and you know, and it wouldn't actually even need to be a huge pad. The, the hut itself has got four feet. The whole thing with batteries weighs probably about 225 pounds. So you could probably just do footers on each leg, you know, and, and, and set yourself up for success that way. Nobody's done that yet. Ideally, the ultimate business opportunity, 500 and up. Yep. Okay. And then long term, you're thinking maybe 50. You know, long term, I, long -term I would like there to be no limit. You know, you know, where if you had 10 cows and, and Nature Conservancy put up the towers for you, you could just <laughs> go, go that way. <laughs> yeah. Now we have a question here. So both, both, both of the, we call them pressure zones, so the auditory pressure, and then there's an uh, electronic pressure. Both of them are programmable, that you can set them up however, you, however wide you want. And then uh, when they're getting the electronic pressure, that always comes with a sound too. And so it goes back to kind of also the training picture we showed. We'll start training the animals off of a physical fence line with an electronic pressure only, which always includes a beep. And then we introduce a sound only zone to see if they learn to associate the beep with the electronic pressure. And then once they've done that, we will move them off the physical barrier to see if they've learned that the virtual fence line means to turn around.
continue to be zapped, like uh, animal welfare side, but this one you're saying it, it lets them back in, or once they get once the, once they once they get on the other side of the, of, of of the fence boundary, like they've busted out a single wire, there's no stimulus. There's no stimulus on the way back in. And there are safety mechanisms built into the collar beyond that. So if an animal gets stuck in a management zone, after a certain number of stimulus, the collar turns off. And right now, that's set at a, a total of 80 electronic stimulus, which can happen over the course of 15 minutes. So if an animal gets stuck for 15 minutes, it turns off until a rancher goes in and says, I want to turn it back on. Cool. So it's, it's human. And then when we talk about what, what that electronic pressure is, it's not taking your single wire and wrapping it around. You know, the animal is just kind of getting it. It is, a, it is a half a second pulse every five seconds that includes a second to beep. Well, I could stand and we could stand and answer questions all day long, but we're out of time, and and uh, I'm sure Bob would wow. like to close exciting, this out. Exciting times, guys. This is pretty doggone special. You know, I promise you earlier you're going to have a good time, and this is what we wanted from our National Grazing Labs Coalition on our conferences. So, mm. thank you for all coming. But I'd like to see you collar that bear because what we need is one more ticked off bear. <laughs> <laughs> And I want to also remind you in Montana, there's a bear in every section and it snows a foot a day. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, closing? Very proud of these guys. Very proud. Thank you.